What would we do without the religious to tell us what we actually think? I mean, we certainly don't know ourselves, do we? Now, I've asked that question before, and funny, we never get any coherent answers, do we? Why? Because they don't care. We know that going in. So, here comes just one more example. Hey, let's go check out Frank Turek again. Why? <laughs> Why not? Although, this time, he's got Gary Habermas on to respond to the adage, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, Gary doesn't like that, but it's clear that Gary has some problems anyhow. He's having trouble stringing words together coherently. I mean, we've never seen that before. So, can he convince us that there's any evidence for his imaginary friend? Yeah, I wouldn't be getting my hopes up if I were you. With regard to extraordinary evidence or, or extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you know, how could you believe in a resurrection? That's an extraordinary claim. You'd need extraordinary evidence. What's your response to that? And we'll get there in a second. I wanted to define a couple of terms here first, since I'm pretty sure that Gary is just going to go right off the rails into religious la-la land, so uh, <laughs> let's do this ahead of time. So, when you talk about extraordinary claims, we mean things that have never been justified to happen at all. If you tell me that you have a dog, that's not an extraordinary claim, because lots and lots and lots of people have dogs. We know that dogs are real, and people own them, and if we wanted to, we could provide evidence for that. If you say that you have, I don't know, a crocodile, well, that's getting closer, I guess, although I actually do know people who have crocodiles. And since we do know and can prove that crocodiles exist, it's not that much of a stretch. Still, I would absolutely ask you to corroborate that you do, in fact, own a crocodile. I'd expect you to trot the crocodile out. However, if you said that you had a dragon, then I'm going to call BS until you can prove that it's true. Now, the religious, they don't like that because they want to think that their imaginary friends are real. They don't want to have to back it up because I think they know that they can't. So, that's how extraordinary claims work. Let's see what Gary has to say. Well, my first thing is I begin to tell people this right off the bat. I'll say, look, I don't know what your definition of extraordinary evidence is, but I've talked to you long enough to know that extraordinary evidence for you means evidence that I will deny no matter what you produce. Bullshit. Absolute, complete, unadulterated bullshit. This is just Gary running around with the goalposts. I already provided my definition of the term, and I'm very transparent in this. Now, for what kind of evidence I would accept, it's the same kind of evidence that I accept for everything else. I don't have double standards. If you said that you had a dragon, you'd have to trot that dragon out for me, and I could take a look at it. And by see, I mean detect in some kind of verifiable way that is objective beyond your head. Nothing less will do. Oh, but my god is invisible. And by that you mean completely undetectable in any objective way, then you are the one with the untestable belief, not me. You are the one who accepts something on blind faith, and that is not something that any credible person should ever do. How is that any different than saying, well, my dragon is invisible? Okay, then I have absolutely no reason whatsoever to think that you have a dragon. Your claim is not sufficiently justified for me to accept it. And that's not me refusing to accept credible evidence. It's you not having anything of substance to present. Therefore, I'm not going to believe you, which is exactly the case when it comes to gods. No evidence presented, no belief supplied. Remember, you have the burden of proof here, whether you like it or not. This is just a childish attempt at a dodge. No matter how strong it is, 
I'll say you don't have enough. And mm -hmm. if I give you things you can't answer and you come up with doofus type answers, you're going to say it's not strong enough. But that's because you don't have anything. This is exactly where faith leaves the realm of rationality. They just want it to be true. But that doesn't mean that it is. How you validate your beliefs determines just how worthwhile they are, and sadly, the religious have absolutely nothing. What we're seeing here isn't evidence, it's an excuse. It's why they can't produce anything at all that would satisfy a reasonable person. These are not reasonable people. These are just con men. Because I'm willing to bet that, excluding their own personal God claim, there is absolutely nothing that they would hold the same level of ridiculous incredulity on. If you want to see that for yourself, ask them if they would accept the existence of any other God in the world on the exact same basis that they accept their own. And the answer, of course, is going to be no. They have no emotional attachment to these other gods or these other religious traditions, so they're not going to believe in the same way. Why would they? It doesn't stroke their egos, and that's really what all of this is about. Of course, they don't like that. Even suggesting it makes them upset. I mean, try it for yourself, it's kind of funny to watch. So, I think we've already established that it's not the atheists that are being unreasonable here. It's people like Gary and Frank. And that's really not much of a surprise, is it? You're not going to believe no matter what. Whatever would we do without people like Gary Habermas to tell us what we really think? You notice who isn't in the room with them, right? Yeah, atheists. Of course not. We might actually have to set them straight. They sure can't have that. No, they get to trot out their own straw man versions of atheism, something that no actual atheist really thinks, so that their followers, who are every bit as dumb as they are, they will all think that they've had it right all along. Because that's what this is really all about. It's not about finding factual reality. It's about stroking the ego of the gullible idiots who are paying their bills. I mean, honestly, how do people not see this? I mean, beyond the morons in the pews, filling the collection plate because it gives them a weekly emotional woody. Tell me I'm wrong. Be prepared to back it up. Go right ahead. And let me tell you the reason you're not going to believe, no matter what. You're probably an emotional or maybe a volitional doubter. Don't ever think for a moment that atheists and agnostics don't doubt. You know, you know, Bart Ehrman has said, he says, I wake up sometimes in a cold sweat in the middle of the night, wondering if there's no afterlife or if I'm going to meet God in judgment. You know, that sort right. of species thing. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me. And here he changes subjects right in the middle of a sentence. So I guess we're going to have to handle the first part before we let him get on to the next bit. Now, I can't speak for Bart Ehrman, but I don't doubt. I mean... I would if there was any evidence of any kind that any of this nonsense was actually real, but I sure don't lose any sleep over his imaginary friends, do you? I'm sure he doesn't wake up wondering if Xenu is real or if Odin is going to kick his ass. That's just stupid. But because he isn't concerned about the factual state of the real world, yeah, he doesn't care. But I am. From every bit of evidence that I have ever seen, and of course none of us can go for anything that we haven't seen, I have no reason at all to think that there are any gods or goddesses or anything like that of any kind out there. And the same goes for ghosts, leprechauns, the flying spaghetti monster, you know, fill in the blank. Why would you fear something that you have no reason at all to think is real? Yet, he doesn't think that way because he is confident, for no good reason, that his imaginary friend is real. So there. And this is where I want to see his reasoning and his steps. How did he actually get there? And I mean, without faith. And it's funny how none of them ever seem to have an answer for that, right? Why are atheists so angry? And you go, well, we're not angry. Uh, I've got a debate here to my left in one of my books where an atheist is debating a well-known New Testament scholar, Craig Blomberg, 
And he says to Craig in the debate, the guy's got a PhD, which is kind of rare for an atheist, but like most atheists who are those skeptics, there's not anything in the field that's relevant. Okay, I just have to break in here. What field is relevant to, I don't believe you? What school do you go to for, you haven't proven your case? Because people like Frank and Gary, they don't know what the hell atheism is. Or they probably do, but they're not going to admit it, because there goes half of their narrative if they do. This is not about truth. This is about money. It's about conning the rubes into handing over their hard-earned cash because, well, they just want to get paid, don't they? So, they lie. Constantly. Because it's not like they haven't been corrected many, many times before. It just doesn't get them where they want to go. You know, the bank. What are they going to do with, well, I just don't buy it. So, that gets brushed aside, and now we know that their magical man in the sky is real. We just want to sin. Because that sells tickets and books and crap like that. It's why they don't have to have real jobs. It's why they're so bad at this. Nobody with a half a brain would ever fall for it. And I'm not sure why their audience does. But he's got a PhD. And he says to Craig Blomberg in the debate, I'm not one of those angry atheists. I want you to know that. And he's an atheist, <laughs> so it's funny. I don't really see what's funny about it. I mean, half the time, I think it's entirely justified to be angry, especially in a religious majority society. If you constantly had people telling you that you were going to go to hell all the time, especially without any proof at all for the proposition, you'd be angry too. If you had groups out there that were actively molesting children and then hiding it from the authorities, you'd damn well better be angry. If they were out there lying to people just to make a buck, you know, like they're actually doing, yeah, you should be angry at that. You should be angry at people who are trying to push a religious narrative to harm other people, to keep them from having equal rights, to artificially make them into sinners that everybody should hate. That should make people angry. I think we've got a damn good reason to be angry, don't you? It's self-defense. It's not like there aren't a ton of angry Christians out there. I mean, look at people like Steven Anderson. He's constantly pissed off, especially when you get into the Christian fundamentalist circles. Screaming at the top of your lungs is pretty much the norm. It wasn't the atheists who came up with fire and brimstone after all. That was the Christians. So yeah, go ahead and, uh, I don't know, fuck right off, Gary. We're just now falling for it. Uh, I, it's their emotions. It's mm -hmm. ex Their claim for emotional uh, extraordinary evidence is A, can't be reached because of their presuppositions, and B, probably because of their emotions. And I'm going to give them data that they cannot. And if they go, well, here's the problem with resurrection. He just did it again, didn't he? Stopped right in the middle of a sentence and just started another. I kind of think there's something wrong with Gary upstairs. I mean, I'm not trying to diagnose him or anything, but he just keeps doing it. All right, anyway, keep going. I want to know what he thinks his wonderful proof is. It's not just resurrection. You have to believe in another world. You've got to believe in Middle Earth, Narnia, or Oz. You've got to believe there's an Emerald City out there somewhere. And I'll go, time out. Have you ever heard of near-death experiences? Yep. Have you ever looked into it? I mean, beyond your religious confirmation bias, because I have. And I'm willing to bet that neither Gary nor Frank ever has, except as a way to make a buck. Because here's the thing. We can explain near-death experiences, and I'm going to go into a little bit of that before I get back to his uh, <laughs> religiously deluded views. Because here's what happens on the religious side. They see something that they think they can use, they read a lot of unsupported nonsense into it, and then they pretend that it actually supports their side. It proves their case. And they are wrong. NDEs are reasonably well understood by science, and it has absolutely nothing to do with religion, spirituality, or the supernatural. It's pure brain chemistry. 
The simple fact is, it is caused by neural regions going offline and the brain trying to compensate. It is doing what it always does, telling a story that is shaped by a person's lived experience, memories, and cultural expectations. Now, most people don't understand how the brain actually functions. They think that uh, memories are just an exact record of what they saw. But they're not. They're just not. That's never been how it works. It's a few things that the brain recalls, and then a story being told where it fills in all the details in the middle. And your memories are only as accurate as the last time that story was told. It's why supposed eyewitness testimony is the least reliable form of testimony out there. It's not good evidence because memories suck. It's why Christians almost always see the Christian God. That's what they expect to see. Hindus almost always see their own pantheon. They don't see things that they are not culturally predisposed to or have experience with. They see what they know because that's what's in their head. That's the only place that any of this is actually going on. People see dead relatives that they're aware of, but not people that they've never heard of before. The brain is desperately trying to process what's going on. It's dumping information as quickly as possible, and the brain remembers bits and pieces of this giant torrent of data when it wakes up. People just don't understand how consciousness works. As I said, they think that memory is a perfect recollection of events, but it's not. It's mostly just concocted on the spot as the brain pulls up what little it actually remembers and just fills in all the gaps. So yes, while we've all heard of NDEs, some people actually know what the hell is going on. Somehow, I don't think that Gary's going to be one of them. But, let's see. Mm. And there are over 300 heavily... People can scoff, they can say what they want. I don't know a field... I, I think NDEs might be the strongest natural kind of data available. And it says there's another world. I mean, how do you know that? Well, when I was up above my body, I was watching you, and you were crying, and I kept saying, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And you never once looked up at me and said, yeah, I know, I can see you. I was somewhere where you couldn't talk to me and couldn't reach me. I was another reality. And that's actually been tested. See, researchers in hospitals have put words and symbols and stuff on top of cabinets where they can't be seen from the ground, but anybody who was floating above their body, they ought to have a bird's eye view. How many of those people have ever come back and known what those signs said? None. Not one. Not ever. And just because the brain is dying, that doesn't mean that your ears stop working. If someone is sitting next to the bed crying, they're probably going to hear you, and that's going to be incorporated into their near-death delusion. Because here again, Gary has no way at all to show that any of this is going on. It's pure interpretation, not evidence. It fits in with his narrative, so he just goes with it. If you asked him any intelligent question about the science behind NDEs, he wouldn't be able to answer. He doesn't actually know anything. He just really wants to believe. And I felt great. And there's over 300 cases where something's going on, by the way, in the presence of measurable, that's all we can say, measurable, no heart, no brain. And they're experiencing things that they report that can be verified. Except we've already proven that they can't be. What's going on out in the hall, for instance? Nobody knows. They can't repeat the conversations that the family members and the doctors were having. They can't tell you anything that anybody said. They can only interpret the input to their own brains and report it as an interpreted experience, filtered through their own social and cultural belief structures. That is not impressive. It's just not. So if they want to know about another world, that's extraordinary. That's mm. extraordinary evidence. Not remotely true. So this entire video was just all over the place. I honestly am starting to think that Gary's got something wrong upstairs. And it could be just age, but uh, 
this isn't the first time that I've seen him behaving like this. He just changes direction in the middle of words like he can't remember what he was saying. Someone probably needs to get him the help that he clearly needs. You know, just saying, trying to help here. Because once we filter out all of the religious nonsense and wishful thinking that he and Frank rely on, what does he have left? Where are the scientific studies that confirm any of his claims? Of course, he doesn't have any of that because he doesn't actually give a crap. He's trying to convince the religiously deluded, who also don't know and also don't care, that he has the truth, and emotionally comforting truth, so that they pay him. It's why, as usual, they're not making videos for us. This is all aimed at people not likely to ask any difficult questions or expect any actual evidence. They all just want to believe. And how pathetic is that?